woke up this morning, saw a world full of trouble. Now I thought, how'd we ever get so far down? How's it ever gonna turn around? So I shook my fist at heaven and said, God, why don't you do something? Well, I just couldn't bear the thought of people living in poverty, children sold into slavery. Thought disgusted me, so I shook my fist in heaven and said, God, why don't you do something? He said, I did. I created you. Time for us to do something. I'm so tired of talking about how we are God's hand and feet, but it's easier to say than be like angels of apathy. Well, tell ourselves it's all right, somebody else will do something. Well, I don't know about you, but. I know I'm sick and tired of life with no desire, but I don't want the flame, I want the fire. I know I want to do something. If not us, then if not me. Time for us to do something. We are the salt of the earth. We are a city on a hill. But we're never going to change the world by standing still. Time for us to do something. If not now, then when will we see that end to all this pain? It's not enough to do nothing. It's time for us to do something. Na na na. Good morning, church. I think that's a word for us today. God wants us to do something. My name is Tim Power. I'm one of the pastors here at Salem, and I am so excited that you are worshiping alongside us 
today. If you would do us a huge favor and fill out one of our online connect cards. You can find this on our website, SalemSTLewis.com, or on our app, or in the comment section below. This will allow us to connect with you, and you can tell us how we can pray for you in these very difficult times. Also, we are in the Thanksgiving holiday season. As you probably know, there's a lot of people struggling right now, and we as a church want to do something. We want to make a difference in our community. We're partnering with LifeWise SDL to sponsor families who need a turkey for this holiday season. You can visit our website and donate $20 to sponsor a family. Would you pray with me as we continue on in worship? Holy God, we come to connect our hearts with yours today in worship. We thank you that you gave it all for us. And we want to give you all of our praise and worship today. I pray that we would become more aware of your presence in our lives. I pray that by your Holy Spirit, we would be able to live differently because of what you've done for us and love differently in light of how you lived and died and rose again on our behalf. I pray that you would just be with us and that you would continue to transform our lives to be more like Jesus Christ. I pray this in your holy name, amen. November is a month when we take time to give thanks. But Salem, all throughout this year, you have been giving more than just thanks. You have been giving hope. 2020 brought about changes that created unfathomable hardships for food insecure children, families, and people experiencing homelessness in our community. In response, Salem focused our efforts on feeding the hungry. And because of your giving, our Haven Street Meal Ministry in South City has fed over 5,000 people. Salem has prepared and served over 3,000 meals for those in need at Epworth. We partnered with LifeWise STL to provide over $20,000 worth of food and essentials to families in need at their drive through food pantry. And when Freedom Schools couldn't have class this summer, we provided 7,000 meals to those students from a food truck at our South City site. Our Holy Smokers Men's Ministry cooked and served over 15,000 barbecue meals for hungry people in St. Louis. We collected and distributed over $5,000 worth of non-perishables through food drives, and we've done even more. But the need is only continuing to grow. Since the pandemic hit, our community Haven Street and Epworth have doubled their weekly distribution. LifeWise STL saw the need from their community triple, and each time Salem has stepped up to help fill the need. As the number of people in need continues to grow, so must our loving action. We need your giving to be able to connect more people with God's extravagant love. Every time we provide food for the hungry, the response is always the same. Gratitude. The kids thank you. The parents thank you. The community says thank you. So thank you, church. But the need continues. And with your help, our work will continue as well. November is typically a month when we all begin to think a little bit more about gratitude about what we're thankful for. 
Many of us will find ourselves around a dinner table this month sharing with others something we're grateful for. Last week, Pastor Terry kicked off our new series, Thanksgiving. It's the idea that gratitude is a verb, an action, a muscle to be flexed. She spelled out a few tangible steps we can take as individuals to begin practicing gratitude daily. She described keeping a journal or making a glad list at the end of each day. The idea is to spend some time at the end of the day writing down gratitude, something you're grateful for, learning, something you learned, accomplishment, something you accomplished, and delight, one thing that brought you a sense of delight that day. Being thankful is transformative to us, not only as individuals, but also communally. It can transform entire communities. What do I mean by that? You see, most often we think of gratitude as an individual act, a vertical act. We give thanks to God for all that God has already given to us. It's vertical. But practicing giving thanks is a holy habit that spills over from the vertical to the horizontal. That is, it spills over to the people around us. As Robert Emmons says, gratitude takes us outside ourselves, where we see ourselves as part of a larger, intricate network of sustaining relationships that are mutually reciprocal. In other words, gratitude reminds us it's not just about me, it's about we. Sharing a meal around a table, giving thanks with others, these are holy practices modeled by the very first Christians. The book of Acts tells us about what it was like to live in community, sharing everything with one another and being grateful. Listen now as Jim shares with us our scripture passage for the day, Acts 2, verses 42 through 47. Our scripture this morning comes from Acts 2, verses 42 through 47, and I'm using the Common English Bible translation. The believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to their community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. A sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Every day, they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. The Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Thanks be to God. I don't know about you, but that life sounds pretty amazing to me. Living in that kind of community is what I dream of, where everyone is taken care of. Let's face it, in America, there is a fierce individualism that can cause us to hold tight to whatever we've got individually or as a household and not let go. We fear scarcity. We fear not having enough of what we need when we need it most. And so sharing with others, sharing everything we've got, well, it doesn't come easy. What if I loan out my leaf blower to a neighbor and he breaks it, and then I need it the next week? Worse yet, what if I let someone borrow my car and they wreck it? Then how am I going to get to work? I mean, surely we can't share everything, right? Those what ifs, those fears, lead us to clench down our fists tight onto what is mine and mine alone. But gratitude says, release, let go. You have enough. God is faithful and will provide for your essential needs. Remember when stores were running out of toilet paper back in the spring? I couldn't help but think about Elaine on Seinfeld sitting in a public bathroom stall and realizing there was no toilet paper left in her stall. So a little sheepish and embarrassed, she politely calls out to the woman in the next stall. There's no toilet paper over here, so um, can you spare some? The woman responds, I'm sorry, but I can't spare any. Elaine, you know, not understanding how this is possible, negotiates and says, but I really just need three squares of toilet paper. The woman continues to refuse to share and eventually just shouts out in frustration, no, I can't spare a square, not even a square. That's harsh. 
communal gratitude says, I'm content with what I have, and I have enough to spare. I can spare a square. As we begin to cultivate the holy habit of gratitude, we find ourselves more content in our daily lives. And as we grow in contentment, we'll find ourselves less fearful. With less fear, we're more willing to let others in to share our lives and our belongings, to share our tables with others. The table is a perfect example of horizontal gratitude. When we gather around a table to break bread and share a common meal, it's an even playing field. There's a sense of mutuality in a shared meal. We're all doing the same thing at the same time. Communal activities have a way of bringing us together. It's been a long time and I know we miss things like sporting events and concerts, but think back to a typical October baseball season in St. Louis. I remember the first year Johnny and I lived here. I quickly learned that if the Cards lost a home game during playoffs, I might as well just keep my head down, not even leave the house, because when you're in public spaces, there is a communal bad mood everywhere. But on the flip side, if we win, we win. The whole city wins. We are united in a feeling of joy and gratitude. Feeling grateful communally can actually move us toward a more grateful and gracious society. But how do we do that in the age of COVID? We still grieve the loss of communal activities that once drew us together. We can't stand shoulder to shoulder singing in unison at a concert. We're worshiping online, not side by side in person and solidarity. And our dinner tables may not even be full this Thanksgiving because we are called to do no harm. And that means separating physically. That means doing things differently with physical distance between us. But physical distance to protect one another is not the same as social, emotional, and spiritual distance. In his little book of gratitude, Robert Emmons describes the arc of gratitude. He says that practicing gratitude amplifies goodness rescues us from negative emotions, and connects us to others in meaningful ways. Connecting with others in meaningful ways, that is what it means to live like the first church in Acts 2. Connecting with others in meaningful ways is communal living. So the real question is, how can we get creative and keep a safe physical distance while still connecting with others in meaningful ways. Let's be real, truly connecting with others doesn't happen in large crowds anyway. It happens through relationship building, one-on-one -on -one in small numbers. I turn to my friends on Facebook for suggestions of how we can do that. I ask, how can we gather in community in safe, socially distant small groups? And here's what some of them said. They gathered on Zoom for virtual happy hour, game nights and reunions. People doing the same thing at the same time, just online. One friend told me that she was inspired by Rachel Ray's cooking show. Rachel did an episode via Zoom where the group took turns teaching one another how to cook different dishes. So my friend said, I'm gonna do it with my soon-to-be daughter-in-law. She's going to teach me to make pound cake and my mom and I are gonna teach her to make dressing. Talk about a meaningful way to connect long distance and not lose those family traditions. Another friend said that instead of doing a Friendsgiving in person with her crew this year, they're doing a craft project together on Zoom and still eating to the heart's content. I love that, so creative. Who would have thought that connecting through a computer screen could be so meaningful, and yet I know it is. Recently, I spent a Friday evening in my pajamas, sitting on the couch late into the night, having a virtual girls' night with two of my best friends of over 20 years. I never imagined I could feel so connected to them through Zoom, but I did. I was a different person after that night. Connecting in such a meaningful way reminded me of who I am, and I was grateful. We need these connections with one another. They're transformative. And no, they don't all have to happen online. Many of the examples people shared of safe communal gatherings revolved around picnics, 
time spent together in small numbers outside around fire pits, circled up in driveways and parking lots. Folding camp chairs are popping up everywhere as people find creative ways to still be together and yet do no harm. Meaningful relationships lived in community with one another is about practicing mutuality and the basic principle of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have done unto you. As Diana Butler Bass says, it's a law of reciprocity. It's not hierarchical, it's neighborly. So much of what divides our nation right now is our inability to see our neighbor as our equal, our inability to love our neighbor as ourself. We demonize those we disagree with rather than humanizing and seeking to understand them. So how can we be grateful with so much hate and unrest all around us? How can we live in community with one another when so much is tearing us apart in her book, Grateful, Butler Bass says that caring for one another is actually a subversive act. She talks about the fact that every day there are reasons not to be grateful, terrible, awful, gut-wrenching, painful things happening every day all around us. Yet she says gratitude is a defiance of sorts, the defiance of kindness in the face of anger, of connection in the face of division, and of hope in the face of fear. Gratefulness resists evil. I believe intentional acts of gratitude will not only transform us vertically in our relationship with Christ and within ourselves as individuals, but also horizontally in relationships with others. What if as a community we were to rebel and resist anger with kindness? What if in the face of division we were to connect with each other in meaningful ways? What if we were to work for the good of all people in what Butler Bass calls the politics of gratitude? The Acts 2 church doesn't have to be a pie in the sky dream of what living in community can look like, but it will take work to make it a reality. Mary Jo Letty lists some habits in her book, Radical Gratitude, that I found to be helpful. And she suggests that we gather with like-spirited people Find or start a group committed to practicing gratefulness as a way of life. And you can do that by joining one of our connect groups or just with your family in your own home. Another is live more simply. Let go of material things that burden you. <laughs> Remember, you can spare a square. And I'm going to add one. Care for the needs of others. Drop a meal at the doorstep of someone suffering from the virus. Call up an elderly neighbor that lives alone just to chat or clean out your closet to find a winter coat for a friend in South City that might need one. Be intentional about providing for other people. As we strive to become more grateful horizontally in community with one another, we build a more just and Christ-like world around us. My prayer is that you'll do just that this week. There's always more room at the table, even with six feet of physical distance. next song is one of my favorites, church. You know, in a time like right now, where we really get excited to, to do something, or there's a high political climate, and we're very active, even if it's just on social media, we feel like we want to do something. You know, we sang that song first, do something. But I want to remind us today, in the Gospel of Matthew 6 and 33, Matthew reminds us to seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and then all of the things that we really desire will be added to us. But I want to remind you, it's not the, the things that we want. It's really the things that God has worked out for us and for our good. So this song is called Seek First.
peace that passes and understanding and joy that conquers fear and regret. See, when we seek the kingdom of heaven, it lays out the perfect platform for us to walk through this world. And I thank God for Christ Jesus, who legacy showed us how to do that church. God, we thank you today for this awesome time of worship. We thank you for your church. And we thank you for your son, Christ, who gave his life that we might live. So God, as we sing these words, we just pray that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts are acceptable in your sight. We pray all these things through Christ Jesus. Amen. Peace that passes my Your 
Thank you so much for worshiping with us wherever and whenever you did so. It is a joy to worship with you when we hope that our time of worship is a springboard for you to take next steps, whatever those next steps are. Maybe for you, it's to find a connect group of people you can grow deeper with. Maybe it's to be involved in our outreach ministries and the ways we're serving the community. Or maybe it's to give because all the things that we do as a community, the ways we share gratitude require each other. And we need your help to be able to have all the things that we do as a church continue. You can give via text, you can give online, you can give via mail. We would love for that to be a next step for you today. Let's pray together as we enter time of worship. God, thank you for the community we have, whatever that looks like in 2020. If it's virtual, if it's safely in person, if it's our family, whatever our community is, we are grateful. May we practice gratitude together in community. Make us be creative. Because together, we get better. We pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.